Just saying, that's a fact. Yo, the Pope just got a boner. <laughs> So uh, what happens is, is if I plug my phone in, uh, Cirque du Soleil. It happens. Oh, every <laughs> you talk to you talk about this every circles. time that it that it uh, that the Cirque du Soleil soundtrack goes nuts. Yeah, let me let me see if I can put you on a audio. Hold on. <laughs> Say hello. Hello. Oh, there's no reason. Just connected the uh, audios. So, fun fact: uh, in an effort to maximize graphic card uh, real estate, so we can make sure that our exporting is going uh, uh, the, the best it possibly can. Yeah, we're down to two monitors that are coming off uh, the, the the graphics card, and the third monitor we plugged a Chromecast in because nine times out of ten we just had it full screened. Uh, with the chat anyway. So now Ashley is able to control uh, from her laptop my third screen. Right, right. Periodically, I'm just getting bird gifts. Like, it's mostly just the, the chat screen until it's bird gifts here and again. That's that's great. Um, you can stop at the light. Right? Some people go through. I just, I just like the fact that, that he didn't look Chuck Yeager enough before, so now he's in motion and chewing gum. Yeah. <laughs> it's Andrew Maine. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right, let me uh man. I feel like the only way to go farther is to have you like actively having sex with like five women at once. Um Um, let me make some calls. All right, uh, I'll, I'll I'll me, uh, we'll set levels here. Here we go. Check, check, check. This is Brian's yeah. level. It's almost uh just shy of negative six. Let me hear you, Andrew. I'm Andrew Maine, talking through my mouth hole, through my phone. Keep, keep going. And I'm talking and uh, heading down the road. I have my chauffeur here. We'll call him Javier. He may uh, be a relative, maybe not. That's and, all I can say. And then Justin? Hi, I'm Justin. I'll talk like this. I'll probably talk uh, maybe a little bit louder, but not really all that loud because I'm trying to save my voice. All right. So there we go. Deleting all this and testing one more time since I changed my levels. I think we're ready to go, gents. This is how professionals work. <laughs> you I make a left at Oak Street and just do street parking or whatever. So. <laughs> All right, I'm ready. I'm ready when you when you gents say so. All right, I'm uh, ready. Uh, can we? Are we up on Diamond Club? Yes, we are live on DiamondClub.tv. Yeah. Thanks to the yeah. fantastic and fabulous Jackie Hearn. Uh, awesome. Well, then let's uh, let's roll. All right. Uh, I'll, uh, as as a personal favor, I will I will give you uh, the Marvel comic of your choice if if. You will not chew gum during the podcast, Andrew. I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, good call. Good call. Now. <laughs> what do you mean, man? I got like five pieces in my mouth. <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, I didn't know. It, I didn't know if it was like important to you or something. You're like, yeah, sorry, man. I got this. Uh, no, I got the whole thing, man. The whole thing. I'm going for Brian. <laughs> Don't ruin it. <laughs> Uh, okay, all right, here we go. I'm ready. We're going five, right, four, right. three, two. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Brian Brushwood. Hey, man. You're, you're live on location. Are you in a spaceship? Well, that's right, Brian. Justin. Justin Robert <laughs> Hi. <Young. laughs> I'm, I'm not in a spaceship. I am in a Scion TC. It's kind of the same thing. Uh <laughs> I have a, uh, my brother's in town and uh, we'll call him Javier and uh, we are taking a trip to Lake Arrowhead and we're sort of like middle of uh, going from trying to get there before it gets dark. But I told him, I said, listen, my dedication to the show is so much so that I'm like, I'm broadcasting. You can't stop me. You cannot stop. He didn't try to stop me, but I had to make can't it. Can't like, stop the signal. 
Yeah, man, look, you're busy fighting the forces of darkness. I get it. So I guess we need to we need to get straight to the weird with no ifs, ands, or booties. That's correct, sir. Uh, of course, we forgot a micro USB charger, so we're back in front of my place right now. That's fine. Um, look, <laughs> that's uh, I believe that's exactly how it happened on Apollo 13, if I remember the movie correctly. Exactly. Speaking of which, um, uh, and not at all secular, we were just at the Warner Brothers studio. We did the back lot tour. That was kind of interesting. Uh, what, what was the best? Uh, what's the highlight of the uh, WB back lot tour? Did you meet the actual uh, Animaniacs? They do they like Universal? <laughs> they, they, uh, uh, do the Animaniacs actually live up in that uh, water tower? I, I yeah, I mean, they, they. It was like before the thing, before the tour began. We watched the seven-minute film, and the last time I saw a piece of propaganda like that was when I wandered my way into a Dianetics, you know, to a Scientology center. Holy and cow! It's like you know, you know, best in the. I mean, it's like yeah, I'm like I like the Warner Bros. Great studio, great history, whatever. But I'm watching this thing going, man, this is like, they're really, really proud of themselves. And they're like, yeah, we put this logo up there so Universal Studios could see it. Da, 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 da. It's like, hey, when are we going on the mummy ride? <laughs> oh, you, you don't have one. Right. And like, like okay. oh, now we're going to see the Harry Potter exhibit. And like, oh, is that going to have like the whole, oh, no, it's just an exhibit. It's not the Harry Potter attraction built at Universal, you know, but. It's still fun. But now, I, now, I like now if I remember correctly, I think I did. I, I believe it's at Warner Brothers. We were turning around one of the corners in the back lot, and all of a sudden, there was like the town square that was all town squares that I ever saw growing up. They're like, yeah, picture the General Lee driving past this. Picture this. We currently shoot this from that. And, it, and I'm like, oh, my God, this is. This is every small yeah. town in America. So Warner Brothers has their town square and then Universal Studios has theirs. And so Universal Studios was, you know, back to the future, all that. Warner Brothers, as you pointed out, was was in Dukes of Hazard, is Hazard County and all that. So, you know, they have their their dueling back lots. But uh Universal's is much bigger, much, much, much bigger. But so it's neat neat doing. Well, that's not why I'm here, guys. Brothers promotional film. <laughs> Not why I'm here. Not why we're here, guys. What? Why, why are? Why are any of us here? I mean, listen, we we do gotta fill time because nothing of interest happened since the last time that we we did a weird things in terms of science uh, news or news of the weird or the frontier pushing. Uh, so so Andrew, go ahead. Let's just get some more filler in here. Yeah, I don't know what to go then. There's nothing. But if we were to talk about something, uh, I went on a fact finding mission for us yesterday. Yeah. Okay, because you know, as you know, we covered the SpaceX launch and then the attempted re -land attempted landing of the dra of the Falcon, and uh, it 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 returned to Earth successfully. Yep, meaning that it, it hit the point where it was supposed to hit whatever the you know the angle and all that was a little bit off. And finally, Elon Musk released some video footage of the Falcon Nine coming back to Earth, hitting the barge, and it's not slamming in it at supersonic speeds, which is of course. It is utterly spectacular footage, and and again, it's like you know everybody. This is this is a a, a, a tip of the hat to the acumen of of the I, I don't know the the social media capability of Elon Musk and of SpaceX in general that they would intentionally release this utterly fantastic explosion footage of the first stage of a rocket gently like uh, swaggering in tripping and then blowing its crap up right across yeah. the, the 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 drone uh, I, 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 I believe brian this is what's technically referred to as a whoopsie doodle well uh, <laughs> you know, it, it, the rocket is like you said gingerly landing and, and it, it bears noting that i i'm pretty sure this was first if not exclusively released on vine yes <laughs> like, yes it, no i believe it came from uh elon musk who just said Close but no cigar. Dot dot dot. This time, and then it's like you just put it out like and without. I mean, this is the best failure I've ever seen, man. <laughs> well, is... it's like you know he they said hey, there's maybe a fifty percent chance of success, and we don't even know we're pulling that out of our butt because we don't really know what the chance of success are. That was you know being upfront about that was cool, um, and then you know. Then to finally, and the fact that, you know, what's amazing is you look at all the things that work right. You know, yeah. this little tiny barge, the size of smaller probably than a football field in the middle of the ocean, this rocket made it back to supersonic speeds, 
came down to a point that we can see this thing, and it's going a little bit too fast and just a little bit wrong angle, and they know why, they knew right away. They said, oh, the hydraulic fluid for the, the, X, the X-wing grids, you know, we didn't have enough. And he said the next rocket already has the right amount for it, so we think that'll be successful. And of course, like we're used to in space and things like that, like, you know, space industry, like, okay, well, the next launch, when's that going to be, 2025? How long do we got to wait? How long do we have to wait for the next launch? Uh, what, a week or two? January 29th. <laughs> That's what's amazing, man. These guys are moving so fast. And plus, it should be pointed out that all of this success, all of this advancement is bonus territory. They, they, None of this is in their contract. They didn't sign a deal with NASA to resupply the space station. And also, by the way, please figure out how to create a fully reusable three-stage rocket. They're, they're doing victory laps after this. Oh, of course. Of course. It's, you know, they're... they're would, be, would have been wonderful if it absolutely worked perfectly the first time. But then you kind of wonder, like, what don't we know? But, you know, in this case, you know, it's they got a bunch of information. They're excited about going forward. NASA's excited. They were able to successfully. Remember, the whole purpose of this rocket launch was to resupply the International Space Station. And that became, that's become such a, oh, yeah, yeah, by the way, they took this, this, this you know, 400 cubic foot capsule, sent it into space. It rendezvoused going 22,000 miles an hour with a platform that's 220 miles up in the air. I did that too, by the way. But, I am. You know, I am not. Up. I'm not going to deny the fact that I definitely left this running in a loop all GD day, the day it <laughs> was released. It, because yeah. it's so hypnotic. It's amazing to watch it come in. To to and wh- how must it have been to be part of the team, seeing whatever live footage there was of this, where it's like it comes in, you're like, oh my gosh, it's not slamming into the ground like you would expect. It's descending slightly askew. Also, suddenly it's ignited and the whole thing is on fire. It's astonishing. And, and you can just clearly see against the night sky just the, the tendrils of flame that are, uh, you know, scattered as it explodes. It really is amazing. And also, by the way, this is the successful return of a first stage rocket for every other time this has ever been done, right? This like, is the oh, most wow, successful. The first stage rocket is... is a complete wash, and now it's in the ocean, and it'll never be used again. That's de rigueur. It is it is the standard operating procedure, and it is only amazing that like it came down so gingerly. That is so amazing. Well, and I guess that's the weird part to me is that we live in an age, and we've talked about this before. How finally, uh, you know, NASA has has learned that it's an extremely important of their or, uh, important part of their organization that they have a social media aspect to it that they get people to understand why what they do is important and they're very savvy we talked about the uh, travel posters that they're doing we, we we talk about the way they have press releases that are that are like uh, rock concerts when uh, things happen and uh, i i think that we live in an age where an honesty has to be part of the entire process and in this regard i think it's great that SpaceX is not refusing to release the footage, that they're not saying like, oh, we didn't quite hit our mark where we wanted to, because it's like they don't have no bureaucratic uh, overlords to make look good. They have shareholders to make look good. And uh, and what they want to do is tell the truth, which is, holy crap, guys, look how close we got to landing this thing. Also, tell me that's not a kick-ass explosion. It's awesome. It's pretty awesome. That's- <laughs> it's, it's, it's like, yeah, it's, you know, got to bang a few things up there you know i gotta gotta rub a little paint you know to get this thing going it's all good i i I don't know if we talked about it on weird things but uh when i read uh the obstacle is the way by uh ryan holiday there's a scene where he talks about uh in his later years uh, uh thomas edison had one of his factories catch fire and uh, all of these exotic rare materials are going up and the flames are, are blue and green and sh- stuff's exploding on all this stuff. And, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's de rigueur on, on the Internet to crap all over Edison and to, to cheer Team Tesla or whatever. But the fact was, in the middle of watching his $20 million factory at the time, his entire fortune go up in flames, he ran full steam at like 60-something years old grabbed his grandkids and said, you have to come now in your entire life. You will never see an explosion like this. And it's like all he was, his number one concern was that his kids, his grandkids get to see the most epic fire explosion of all time. And, uh, and I feel like there's a little bit of that happening in, uh, uh, you know, in this release as well. Well, and, and, more than that, you know, or, or at least uh, to to uh, piggyback on that, it, it 
is, and we touched on this a little bit last week, that this is not a given that people watch this and say how rad, you know, they're, uh, we're still at the infancy of private space travel and it's only based on the goodwill of what SpaceX has done over the past five or six years that we are now at the point where we can watch something blow up. We can watch a rocket blow up and have it not be immediate PR death or at least a, a step backwards for well, what, SpaceX. Yeah, but it also like SpaceX is a different position because we've had, we've had, there have been, there were three blow ups like, 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 you know, there was a uh, spaceship two had, of course, it's tragic, you know, it, you know, tragic disaster, you know, where fortunately one, one pilot was able to survive, one lost his life. You had, you know, the, the other, uh, the other space station resupply rocket that didn't blow up. And so there has been this sort of attitude, but here SpaceX is like, this is the part where we expect things to blow up. This is the part, this is, we're at the point, like, we get things to the space station. After that, that cargo, that space aircraft is dead weight. You know, it doesn't exist anymore. Nobody ever counts them. And so now we're confident enough to, to experiment with that and to play with it. So our explosions are different than your explosions, in a sense. Oh, certainly so. And and, 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 and that is a a testament to how far SpaceX has, has pushed the boundary. And, and they have uh, very much earned mm. the right to release a vine where one of their rockets explode and we can all lift our, our hands and cheer. What an awesome explosion and not like, well, look at, look at the yahoos trying to put rockets into the sky. Like, you know, yeah. they've earned it. They've earned that respect. So I went to SpaceX yesterday, thanks to our good friend TJ. I was able to bring my brother and another friend to show them and I got to meet uh, TJ's kids, by the way, TJ's got these, he's got three of these super bright kids, which uh, complete faith in the universe. Anyhow, uh, when you remember we walked in and we were so taken by when we saw the landing leg and how they the landing leg. That strut, like that giant by. strut that they, you thought was a piece of the architecture and it turns out to be a leg <laughs> to land. I, I knew what it was, Brian. I, I, I well, that's I I, was, okay. In my defense, I knew once you told me. All right, so that makes true. two of us who knew yeah. once you explained. In my defense, I, I had no idea knew, about anything. And I'm still unclear on what happened. Stop crying and weeping. Do you know what this means? Um, so what they have now, when you turn around and you see that landing strut, is they now have on that wall a photo, like an image of the fuselage of the rocket, and then like the background of like McGregor, Texas. So you get an idea. You see this thing, you know what it's supposed to be. So it's not just the leg. Now you can see the rocket and everything else. Which is just a really cool addition. That's me. amazing. So you get the context immediately just by looking at it. Yeah, it's just. Miming to my brother, give me a soda instead of a bottle top. Oh, dude, that's uh, I saw I saw that in Top Gun. That's uh, this you're flipping it upside down to dispense your Pepsi into your uh, your <laughs> mug, right? Coke Zero. Uh, uh, all right, when, I, when, I, uh, when we do re, -do, re edit Top Gun, it'll put in Coke Zero. So, gentlemen, now we're thinking like, all right, space, great. What is it good for? What do we want to use the space thing for, right? So what? So what if we have a reusable rocket in two weeks? So what if we can reuse 70% of the craft and eventually be fully reusable? What's the big deal? Um, I mean, I would... Yeah, what is the big deal? I don't know. Hey, man, listen, uh, you rocket heads, you always talking about <laughs> rockets. Like, I, don't give a, I don't give a rat's ass. How does that affect my mortgage? So maybe you're like, well, I'll tell you how it'll affect your mortgage, actually. So like, all right. Maybe like we go to like let's go to Mars. Like we could go to Mars. So Mars could be cool because like you walk into SpaceX, one of the first things you see there is they have two photos of Mars. One is Mars as it is now, all red and dusty, and another one of Mars green and lush with water and life, right? But let's say you're like, you know what? I'm not so into Mars. What do you got for me? Like, well, you know, we got Venus. We talked about Venus, the problems of Venus. Like Venus, you know, Venus is pain in the butt. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I mean, granted, yes, but just understand, your focus should not be on Venus. It should be on uh, the ability to live with us among the clouds. That's yeah, that's right. what matters. You truly belong with us and drinking True. Coke 45. Also, Ryan, yeah, have you, ever, you ever seen an Ugnot? I'm just saying. Uh, ever see a what? An Ugnot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, fine. So, so we could say, like, right, let's go a little further out. Like, we have that. I'm a big point. point I'm a big per planner, promoter of living on asteroids, haul them out, virtual reality, 3D projection system. Dude, everybody stuff. knows that you're an ass man. When it comes to Dude. space, he's all about damn asteroids. Am yeah. I right? I am. I am. 
I am, man. I'm like those, you know, those, you know, Trojan objects, all that. Big See, no, I, I t- here's what I feel. I feel like space people be in two categories. You're either an ass man or you got roid rage. Either you're down with the asteroids or you hate them. I have other options for you here, right? Okay. Um, yeah, well, for, although I'm I really curious for uh, other... Brian to describe what ass men be like. <laughs> ass men be like, oh man, I want to get up all in that. <laughs> I want to live right. inside. But we, but meanwhile, them roid ragers, I'll be all like, man, that that ain't nothing but just just uh, ice and rock. No, do the voice. You gotta go like, oh, I don't know. I think that's just ice and rock. <laughs> oh, those rocks in space sure do seem like a waste to me. <laughs> I, I want Brian to do like I like big rocks, but I can't. Like <laughs> <laughs> My asteroid don't want none of that. <laughs> so moving further out, back to seriousness. So if we go further out, then after Mars, we've got to figure out Jupiter. Jupiter's big. Jupiter's really huge. You, you know, if you could, you could like live in the clouds of Jupiter, and you wouldn't be too heavy. You could Saturn, you'd be barely heavier than you are on Earth if you're in the clouds. Even though it's so much more massive than Earth, you're so much further away from the center of gravity, your weight isn't going to be that big a difference. But you got that. But like Jupiter, we got Europa. We talked about Europa. Europa's cool. Twice as much water as Earth. Yeah. Uh, well, and right. I guess also, if, if am I remembering correctly that, uh, that, that I know it's true for Jupiter. I don't know if it's the case for Saturn. But Jupiter puts off more heat than it takes in from the sun. Is that right? Maybe. I'm not the one to judge. <laughs> let me uh, let me let me type that fact into Google and see if that's what comes up as correct. <laughs> so we go past Jupiter. You got uh, what do you got next? Um, Uranus. Yep. Yeah, Uranus. Neptune. And you got Neptune, right? And then you got uh, you know planetoid. Uh, like you got you got you got Pluto, right? Yep. Yeah. And then there's like some other objects out there, Sedna, whatever. And then like you know, there's some some other kind of big objects that aren't that big, but are still you know not you know things you ignore like uh, Ceres, etc. But anyhow, gentlemen, you want other options that you're saying like yeah, maybe Pluto's too small for me. Maybe I want something else. What do you got? Maybe you want to yeah. go a little further outside the neighborhood because the real estate prices are really high. Everybody's hold going on, to hold on. Are we about to start talking about like some of these dark stars that may or may not be harboring some chemocentric light? Life? Um, dark stars? No, bro, we're not talking about dark stars right now. No, I mean dark planets, just those floating planets. Well, we're not talking about rogue planets, Brian. What a, What else is there? I mean, there's you the Oort cloud. Baby, come on. I, I need to know options. So, uh, what about, what about maybe, I don't know, 180 light years out there, still technically within the confines of our solar system? You got all kinds of other potential objects, trans uranium or uranium objects, trans uranium objects, or trans Neptunian objects, rather. Pardon me. You've got these other potentials. There's some, there's some research papers that just came out. A couple of scientists, these mad cap scientists, saying, "Hey, you know what? We've looked at the math, and we've come to a different conclusion than some of you all have, and we think it's entirely possible." There might be super Earths 180 light years or so away from Earth, but technically within our solar system. 180 light years. Okay, AUs, AUs. Got it, got it. Yeah, I, light years. Man, that uh, that went by me twice, and I was just like, man, I really don't think you could call it. Okay, but I'm glad. I'm glad it's AUs. The got new it. Map, Brian. It's the new map. It's 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 Andrew Math. Got it. I'm gonna switch over. Is this, is the road noise too loud? Uh, not really. No, no, no okay. you're fine. So anyhow, you've got now. There's a pull up like uh. I think try, type in like trans uh, Neptunian objects or type in like new planets. I can switch over to Pocket to see if I can pull up the, the research paper. But, you know, there's some credible people saying there might be some very massive objects out there that are 180 astronomical units away, which is uh, astronomical unit is, by the way, is like 90 million miles. All right. So what uh, should surprise no one is the first thing to come up is a Wikipedia entry where it talks about the list of trans-Neptunium objects. Um, and there's a lot of them. There's a lot of objects. Holy cow, is there a lot of them. So and this is all just real estate. Are, are in, in terms of what we would look at with today's technology, how long is it, like, at, at optimum, would it take for us to get from where we are to where they are? 
So, okay, if you type in two or more undiscovered planets can be hiding in our solar system, you can pull up the IO9 article about this. Okay. As far as, as, far as getting there, so, so if we want to do a little bit of math, we look for like, you know, you have objects that can, we have like a craft that can pick up speed as they leave our, our you know, trajectory. They do maybe get like a solar And, you know, if we're going, if, you're, if we're sending stuff to the moon, it's maybe going like 25,000 miles an hour. If we're sending stuff further on, like we have probes going 40,000 miles an hour, you have some that eventually pick up speeds that are moving like even a block faster than that. We have on the, we have, speculative technology, not, not fanciful stuff, but speculative stuff like plasma engines and stuff that might take you up to 300,000 miles an hour. Well, so, 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 so what, does that, what does that mean in terms of um, uh, our ability to, to run on out there? So what we do is we'd say, okay, if we said, if we said there are 180 astronomical units, there should be 180 times 90 million math for us. Well, okay. I, I I guess I guess for me, I'm less concerned about how quickly we're able to get out there, but more concerned with like, uh, uh, how how do we power those things? I mean, I guess if the objects are big enough, uh, as you've proposed before, because you're an ass man, uh, you carve out the inside, you throw some kind of fusion sun-like entity in the middle that is is controlled, radiating out heat and right. getting us all to a toasty these, seventy degrees. These are things we're carving out. These things. Earth-sized or bigger. Well, then, how do you? How do you? Well, how no, do no, we... no, 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 no. Uh, you're, you're talking about the trans-Newton, uh, Neptunian objects, right, Andrew? I'm talking about the the potential. We're going beyond that now. Talk about the stuff that's the bigger stuff that's out there that could still be out there. That's you know. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Stuff. So it's not not just carving and hollowing at uh, an, an asteroid like these are. But, but that that seems like that seems asteroid. like a like a bigger problem. I guess. I mean, we could still dig in holes and and live underground inside them. Uh, and what's funny is, as I'm asking, how do we do this? Tensor guy in the chat, as as if it's a sporting event, is is shouting antimatter, 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 antimatter. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess so. I mentioned that uh, our show is one of the top science educational podcasts. <laughs> 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 That's amazing. <laughs> so you say, okay, how do we, what do we, how do we got this cold ball somewhere out there in the middle of the, at the farthest reaches of our solar system that may be Earth sized? Now think about this. As we've talked about with rogue planets before, it doesn't mean it's totally inert. You can have geothermal activity, you can have water, you can have ice caps, you can have liquid water underneath the ice caps, you can have, you know, oceans, entire oceans there. But how do you, you know, how would you make this thing habitable? You know, that's a good question. You know, we could, you know, the, the amount of solar collectors you would need would be just immense to try to collect enough sun's energy. But there might be other ways to try to figure out, like, you know, domes on the surface, what have you, living in the ground. But you would have Earth, you could have Earth-sized Earth gravity. I'll tell you what, though, like, like picture, uh, picture a world in which, you know, once we crack a few energy barriers or what, what have you. So picture, we find one of these... Um, uh, you know, roughly planetoid-sized things. It's it's got a crust of of, we'll even say uh, rock all the way around. But there's a core or a, a giant layer of liquid water in the middle. Uh, some chemothermic vents uh, and some natural life or whatever. Uh, it seems like by the time we would get to this point, we'd be we'd be so rad. I mean, we can make cats glow nowadays. It seems like we could just uh, introduce some some glowing um, uh, algae populate the entire outer surface with it, uh, build yourself a few bubble cities and, uh, and some, some fish that glow, and this place could feel, you, it, it wouldn't feel like, uh, like claustrophobic, like you're trapped inside of a, of, a, of a, you know, on the edge of space inside of a, um, uh, an asteroid. Anyone growing up there is just going to believe that uh, they have the best view in, in the galaxy of, of this amazing uh, light bright sea aquarium all around him. You know, Freeman Dyson had said something, I think it was Freeman Dyson, had suggested something for how to try to detect life on the outer outer planets or the outer moons. And his idea was we should shine a really, really bright laser towards like the moons of Jupiter or Saturn because his theory was that if there were things that were that far out there that they would be trying to collect as much sunlight as possible 
and they would probably reflect light back like a cat's eye. Oh, wow. That's... So, if you go that much further out, maybe there's not life, but as you pointed out, if there's geothermal life, maybe we can engineer, like you talked about, algae, things like that. I think that's a great idea. I mean, maybe we make like Pandora, you know. You know, maybe maybe what we do is we have fine like things that grow on the surface we can walk through and climb through, and it's an organic thing. Maybe we're thinking of a novel in our head right now. <laughs> well, well, it's it's so funny because I spent I spent the first half of my life, and I guess statistically it's now the first half of my life since my birthday was yesterday and I turned old. Um, the uh, uh, I spent the whole first half of my life thinking, uh, wondering, you know, are we alone and hoping we weren't and hoping there's other stuff. And now maybe it's something about, you know, I've made life. I made three beautiful little girls and we continue to shape them. All of a sudden, I'm so okay if we're first. All that means is that we get to be the architects. We get to shape the world and uh, the universe, in, in, in fact. And it's like, I don't know, that the I, I am shocked at my pivot in that regard of feeling like really good of like, to me, if there's nobody else out there, that's rad. Just means there's a big old blank canvas for me. We gotta shave our heads, down naked, dive into Niagara Falls, and spread our seed. Yeah, wait, what? <laughs> Andrew's got a very weird idea of procreation, by the way. <laughs> yeah. That's how you have kids, right? You shave down your head, you jump in naked in Niagara Falls. Next thing you know, you're out on the shore. The kid comes out. Oh, Whatever. you're talking about Prometheus. I get it. Okay. No, no, no. What Justin said. Okay. <laughs> Well, what's funny is first I was thinking about Leo Laporte of the Twit Network and I'm, <laughs> because he recently shaved his head and I was trying to follow him <laughs> into the jumping off Niagara Falls. <laughs> uh, well, all right. So uh, I think it's amazing that we're looking at this so seriously. And, and what, what what's really thrilling to me is how much we can link our first two stories of, you know, these discoveries and this like rapid advance in, in rocket technology, the likes of which we haven't seen in, in decades and decades and decades. And I think that's what's so uh, awesome about, you know, momentum in this area, in, in this science, is that like now everything is seen in a different light than if th this exact same stories about the undiscovered planets in our solar system were to come out 10 years ago, it would be like a talking point and something for like, you know, the front page of the science section of USA Today or something that would be 200 words. And that's really all it would matter in terms of pop culture. Now, when it's next to SpaceX looking to make rocketry cheaper and, and we are, are rapidly uh, approaching a point where this is going to be something that is in the next year or so of our, of our worldview, all of it is more impactful. Yeah, man. The fact that uh, I, 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 you you probably know this by rote, uh, Andrew, but like you know, you think about the space race, and obviously we threw a bunch of bad rockets up in the air, but because of the and you know we were just throwing so much money at the problem that it didn't even matter. There had to be rockets that they saw blow up on the launch pad, didn't even make it up, didn't get more than 20 feet in the air, crashed and blew up. But they had seven more of the same wrong design that, I, I, I'm, and I'm making all of this up, but I would imagine that they had to just keep on going. I was like, well, we're spending the money we need. Maybe there's something that, else we'll learn from these things. Yeah, you know, that was the early stage of the NASA. You know, the first thing we did is we took, we took a lot of the, we took the V2 rockets that we had that the Germans had built. By the way, the first people to put an object in his face, the Nazis, um, and they were bad people because they couldn't see the potential for good. You know, that was, a, they talk like Werner von Braun, you know, like we talked about when they watched the first rocket, he was, he was like, great, it's just landed on the wrong planet when it bombed London. Right. Um, but, you know, we took those rockets and then we, we, we created a civilian space agency, very much thinking about the impact that ha how much was driven by war and when it created a civilian space agency, but we did tons of explosions and we had the Redstone rockets. Lots and lots and lots of blow-ups. Lots of this trying to figure out how these things work. And that's and every time you want to push the envelope, you do that. And the problem is, is once you push it and then you figure out what works, you are afraid to try something different. You know, the Soviets developed really good rocket technology. They tried some different stuff. Like, you look at, like, their big, like, heavy-lift rockets. They tried with spinning rotary. I mean, just crazy designs. And then those kind of failed on them. The Buran, their space shuttle didn't sort of work out. And then they just sort of went back to what was best with the Soyuz, which is super dependable. And then when the Soviet Empire ended, and you look at modern Russia, they had.
have it evolved, those rockets. Well, I, I would imagine, you know... Uh, Given that the Cold War was so much of, of a pissing contest when it came to the space race, where it's like it was a loss if you launched a rocket that did poorly and spectacularly blew up and that footage were to escape or go somewhere. Like, you wanted hits. You wanted to be known as the people who kept getting into space over and over and over again. Whereas, weirdly, uh, we, we live in a culture that, that I, I think in a very positive way, you know, internet culture is one that praises failure. You know, it, it shows that you're Try taking it, chances. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. They, uh, it, it, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, we try to, if you're trying something new and different, we sort of embrace that. If you fail at something we've been doing already, then it's like, well, come on. I want to, I want to change the topic, but only so slightly, only a few degrees. So imagine you're a hypothetical industrialist who's developing rapidly, rapidly reusable rockets. You're about to announce maybe this year a new line of rockets that could take you to Mars, just in theory that you're this guy that can do this, that, that you have, you're on the verge of doing this. And you're not only saying, okay, problem number one, I need to make a cheaper rocket. Pretty much, we think we've got that figured out. Problem number two, we need to make a much, much bigger rocket. And you're like, okay, our designs have been good so far. We think we know the pathway to a, to a much, much bigger rocket. You're like that. And so then you're like, all right, we can go to Mars. But then you have another problem. Well, how to, how to make Mars fun again. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, why go to Mars, that dusty old windbag? Yeah, dusty old claptrap? Let's, let's, let's say that you, you know, you're, you're not worried about enthusiasm to go there, but like, Brian, if we went to Mars right now, right now, we hopped into Mars, we hopped into a rocket, we went to Mars, what would we find? Uh, what would what would we find? We'd find me holding my breath and squeezing my eyes shut so that I don't... Exactly. Because I, I, saw, I saw Total Recall, sir. Yeah. So we have a little problem. We might have the rockets to go to Mars, but, you know, humans, we're delicate. We need some place to live. We need some place to hang out. You know, my, the Andrew Main maxim is I ain't going to Mars till there's a Taco Bell. <laughs> Elon Musk has realized this, and he's like, all right, all right, you wanted me to, you wanted a cheaper rocket. I've done this, guys. All right, you want a reusable rocket? All right, I'm building this. Oh, we want to go to Mars? You guys, oh, great. Okay, fine. I will build rockets that will go to Mars. Are you happy now? Like, oh, what are we going to do with Mars? That's your problem now. You need a Martian city? Is that what you're saying? You need a city on Mars, right? Say what, say what I hope you're, say what I hope beyond all words I hope you're about to say, Andrew Maine. Well, I mean, he said we need to build a city on Mars, but he's taking it a step forward. How are we going to pay for the city on Mars? Uh, with Martian gold. Martian bitcoins, what could be that? Uh, well, Elon Musk is a very practical guy as we passed our second Tesla on the road. Elon Musk has a plan to take the city <laughs> By the way, Mars. by the way, this is not a joke. This is actually who Andrew Maine is. As he is dictating his his popular podcast listened by tens of thousands of people, uh, novelist uh, Andrew Maine is also passively counting the number of Teslas on the highway. As a shareholder, I have an interest. In <laughs> so, so Musk made it. Musk made a talk last night in Seattle, where he announced that they're opening up an office for SpaceX in Seattle, where they'll be hiring people to do more design. That's one of the things that was very apparent to me, by the way, when I went to SpaceX yesterday. They're bursting at the seams. I mean, they are. You know, this is. You look over in one place. This is where they make the engines. Over here is where they're making the capsules. Over here, they make the spacesuits. That's really cool that they do that, but they're getting too big. And when they want to start making craft to go to Mars, they need more space, more designers, all this. But he says, yeah, I'm opening up an office in Seattle. And by the way, we're looking to get into another area of business because uh, we think this could be very successful. And if, we want to fund, if I want to fund a city on Mars, we'll need to do this. Oh, my God. Are you saying you need Mars mobiles? You need, like, cars to cruise no, Mars? I, think, I, I mean, I haven't... He's having... got a terrestrial business he's launching. Now that he has these really cheap rockets, he says he's going to provide, he's going to become an Internet provider. They're, trying, they're looking into developing... Oh, shoot, I read about internet. this. Yeah, yeah, they have to build They have to build Mars' Internet. Before, But that's part of it. But he's going to build Internet on Earth first. He wants to take a ring of, like, hundreds of satellites, not at 30,000 feet out or whatever geostationary orbit is, he wants to put these at 700 miles out. Reese says it will be competitive with fiber. 
because okay, all right, all right. So 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 for for the le- the the for those even less technical than these two magicians and blogger about magicians, uh, the uh, <laughs> magician, thank you. <laughs> uh, but but like uh, circus uh, magician, but, circus magician, thank so, you. All right, fine. <laughs> the the the, uh, uh, the uh, problem. Tower pizza bus boy. Thank you. <laughs> Wait, does this make me technically the most qualified? Is because I used to work for Dell. Yes. <laughs> uh, right, right, right. Okay, okay, all right. Dell employee, circus <laughs> magician, and tower pizza of Davie, Florida bus boy. So so when uh, when when somebody gets uh, satellite internet, there's the the problem with it is that while the bandwidth is is very very high. In fact, I remember in uh, 1990. 1996, 1997, we were one of the first to get the uh, the, the direct PC uh, by Hughes uh, satellite thing. We happened to have a south facing balcony in our in our in our thing, and it was awesome. We had T1 speeds. It was over a megabit. However, the uplink had to be over our 56k modem. Uh, and and there was a giant like two or three second lag, so it was utterly useless for playing video games. However, if you wanted to download big files, it happened. And the reason the lag was so huge was because it has you. It had to go, as you pointed out, you know, eight miles out, get bounced off off a satellite, gets reflected down, then get back to the internet. But if you're saying it's only how how many miles up? No, Robert, it, it's satellite internet. It's going to thirty thousand miles out. 30,000 miles. Dag, oh, you're right. So it, it, it's taking, it's taking uh, quite a few trips around the surface of the Earth to, you know, to make its round trip from the satellite back to you. And understand, you go to the satellite, it's got to ping somewhere on Earth, get a response, they go ping that satellite. You, you ping the satellite, the, single, the satellite pings Earth, it te- gets the information, then it goes back to that satellite, comes back down to you, so it's taking a total of, a hundred, it's going halfway to the moon and back. Yeah, well, and, and speaking of which, like, I believe the latency to the moon is is two full seconds, right? And I remember yeah. thinking, uh, this is what a child I was in college, was the moment I found that out, I was like, you could never play Doom from the moon. You would, <laughs> you would, right. you would just get your butt kicked. You, you can't do 2,000 milliseconds lag. So uh, people in the chat are saying that, that latency on geostationary satellites is about a half, milli, or a half a second, 500 milliseconds, which is huge. Yeah, and, and again, that, that's assuming best-case scenario, and, that, and, that's under, and so what, what Musk has said, and the reason you use geostationary is because it's just one satellite. You hit it, it comes back, it's over one area. Another version that you can do is a constellation of satellites, like the Iridium Network, is the idea if you have a bunch of satellites that are much lower orbits, like 300, 200 miles up, and they're handing off traffic back and forth. And that, and as switching technologies become faster, that's become a better technology. And when we built Iridium, we designed that like 20 years ago, guess what? Things are much better now. Musk wants to put, and, and by the way, like, I mean, there, and there's tons of satellites there, despite what some certain famous astronomers said when they criticized the movie. Uh, it's, it's very ripe for these communication satellites. What Musk wants to do is put them up at about 700 miles up, because he thinks that's a pretty good, a bunch, hundreds of his satellites up there, and using really fast switching, and he points out that light travels, like, like light travels something like 40% or 60% faster in a vacuum than it does during through fiber. Wait, so, so, so if, if I can guess where you're headed here, um, it would actually be faster to go the 700 miles out to space and then have it relay the long way around the planet rather than go through a glass-based medium like fiber optic cable on the planet Earth just to get to the other side of the planet. Or competitive, or competitive with that. That's astonishing because you realize not only... Um, and, and I'm sure he's thinking of these kind of things. Number one, uh, he'll, he'll make a mint because he will lay the groundwork for what will be the Internet uh, on, on Mars. But more importantly, and probably less discussed, is despite the fact that this will be a private corporation who's doing it, and you could demonize private corporations all you want, at the end of the day, this would be the complete democratization of high-speed Internet across the entire planet Earth, right? Well, it's, it's an internet service that exists outside of boundaries and borders. You don't have to worry about, you know, the big question is where is he going to get the bandwidth on Earth level to do this? But, yeah, it, it becomes, it introduces an idea of building an internet that's, as you point out, totally free of land, totally free of borders, totally free of that. You can make it like, available. Like, like all, all of a sudden, like there was a moment that Egypt just switched off the internet. That would not be possible under this under this scenario. 
Yeah, it would be, I mean, it, it'd be either, you know, you can help jammers and things like that, but it would, effectively it would be very difficult to do. Well, and and, 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 in, in, and to put it in the context of other news this week, you know, uh, uh, President Obama put forth uh, support for legislation that would repeal uh, uh, municipal broadband internet restrictions and stuff like that. Like, it, it is very complicated to lay fiber optic or, you know, gigabit uh, internet right now in general, no matter who you are, be you a government or private entity. This takes a step in saying, hey, listen, all you need is the equipment and we're ready to roll because because we're just hovering outside, uh, you know, 700 miles out above the earth. Yeah. So it, it, the, 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 the short answer is that it means that, you know, your future phones, your future devices like that might just have a chip that's designed to talk to there and that you're buying your telephone and your internet from Elon Musk. I mean, uh, uh, as the chat room rightly points out, uh, how long until he changes his last room, last name to Wayland or Tyrell? I mean, this is this is the kind of person who uh, uh, ends up running a, a legacy empire to last generations. He's got five kids. <laughs> I'm, 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 you know what? Like, are we going to enter in a, 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 an Egyptian style pharaonic dynasty? You know, I don't know. But so far from where I'm looking, it looks pretty good. I'll, I'll tell to, you. I'll tell, I'll tell you what, though. This was what, one of my one of my favorite moments uh, that you know, as 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 painful as it was at the moment, uh, it was when I was doing this week in tech. You know, speaking to. Um, uh, uh, oh, doggone it! Who's the science fiction author that's amazing? That's always on there uh, that I argued with. Um, uh, Moat in God's Eye. Uh, oh, Jerry Purnell. Jerry Purnell uh, thought everyone was crazy for doing all this just-in-time management, uh, relying on the internet for stuff to show up days before. And he talked about the need to have stores of this, that, and the other. Uh, and and my response to him was was you know what else requires just in time management uh and information you know efficiency is my liver and my heart and my lungs like like they operate with the assumption that this the next shipment of oxygen rich red blood cells is going to show up on time and i think that's where we're getting to where it's like um you know uh, the three of us are are old enough to remember a time when the power went out fairly regularly uh, that uh, what, certainly cable went out all the time and nowadays we live in a, a phase where that's just this is crazy talk that never happens and uh, although the internet still goes I want to live in your place my cable going to stop all the time Oh does it really I I mean oh, well, but, yeah. but at the same time it's like you know, now it's like, oh crap! Now I have to tether my phone to my. Uh, yes, my, it's my an inconvenience because you're like, oh, now I gotta reroute this other subsection of the brain because I had a stroke. Uh, well, I mean, there's just it, it's far more blanketed, or it's like if everything's really a piece of crap, you have to go across the street to the Starbucks or something. You know, the the. Yeah, idea. I mean, but, uh, yeah, but yeah, yeah, but I mean, I I took out. I I said, all right, I know if I want to get from get, get to where we're going before it gets dark. I I was pretty confident though. I can hop in my car, turn on my phone, use my LTE connection, and do a video connection with you guys. Absolutely. You know, and that, you know, well, and, 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 and that's, and, and here's what nailed it is, uh, and by the way, this is a good segue for us to take a moment and thank all of our fabulous patrons. Uh, right now, this is a commercial operation. We are two thirds of our way to our goal of, of, a thousand dollars an episode. We're at 620 an episode. Uh, once we hit a thousand dollars an episode, we're able to continue to pay for our fantastic, uh, producer Bryce Castillo in order to make everything happen. There's a few extra bucks for us to run some experiments and for uh, us to guarantee that we'll show up every single day, uh, on time, give or take, and the mere fact that you're able to uh, uh, do a passable job hosting this show, Andrew, while your chauffeur drives you and you use a global intercommunication network in order for us to talk about what I assume next will be goblins is freaking amazing, man. I'm a fan. <laughs> uh, by the way, we are at 399 right now. Who's going to be 400? 400 patrons. Well, that's true. That's uh, uh, we're creeping up on the size of my graduating class. Who's gonna be next? I'm hitting refresh. We're still at 399. Still at 399. By the way, keep in mind all of this stuff is what keeps us 100% independent and uh, able to continue to grow the constellation of in independent producers, stars that you've come to enjoy thanks to your friends at DiamondClub.tv. By independent, I mean if we could be any more further into you know the, the pocket or the, the devotion of, of SpaceX and. Elon Musk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. By the way, you know, pony up, Elon. We know you're listening. 
It's, it's like, it ain't like we're going to change our opinions. Might as well just go ahead and hire us full time. Exactly. Just I'm, officially bring I'm, us in as your propaganda ministers. <laughs> I'm afraid to like mention that I'm gonna go to you know, like go visit there or whatever because I'm afraid they'll like I'll go to the desk I'm like hey Elon says you kind of gotta tone it down. All right, yeah. I might I might uh, I might literally be setting money aside in an account that within five years I hope would be enough to uh, to to buy a Tesla vehicle. Them self driving cars though, know what I'm saying? <laughs> well, I'm a fan. All right, gentlemen, is it time for picks? Yeah, uh, I, I, I got uh, two, two picks. One is completely self-serving. The other is something that kind of touched me out of nowhere. I didn't really expect to. Uh, well, let me go with my pick first, Brian. All right, go for it. Uh, go for it. So my pick is, it's self-serving, um, so I'm going to self-serve with myself first, is uh, I want everybody. I've seen the first parts of this. I'm a fan of this. Uh and uh, I'm excited where this is going. It's uh, one of my favorite franchises in comic books. By comic books, I mean motion pictures on television. We call TV shows. And I'm talking hacking the system tomorrow, Monday night on that Geo. <laughs> you did it. You totally tricked me. I went eight <laughs> different directions. I didn't know what to actually load up. Uh, well, as no, a matter no, of fact. No, no, Little Brian Brushwood here. <laughs> uh, after the very, very successful uh TV special he did, Hacking the System, that she was like, you know what? We need more Bri. We need more Bri. We got more Bri. I need an injection of Bri. I need Bri doing things, showing me how to do things, break windows, use batteries to do stuff, all kinds of crazy stuff. We need a lot of Bri. We need Bri. America needs Bri. The world needs Bri. And they have more Bri. More Bri is coming to you. But you've I, got to watch it tomorrow. I think one of my favorite things, yes, it is tomorrow night. We're going to do a live watch party. Everybody's invited. Uh, it's going to be happening at DiamondClub.tv. It'll be 9 p.m. Central Time uh, on uh, Nat Geo is the channel um, in beautiful high definition. The first two episodes that they've selected Easter. to run. 10 Eastern. 10 Eastern. Everybody else can do math. Half the population of, the, of America lives on the East Coast. Ten okay. Eastern. Yeah, well, I, I I don't trust myself to. Bonnie always gets confused because she's like, "Why do you say 10? Uh, that that's also how my wife talks. Uh, tell her, don't <laughs> don't tell her. Brian, I, that. Well, I don't know why you keep saying 10. <laughs> um, the, my favorite thing that happened, I, I I asked for I asked for like you know, uh, hey, if you want to give me a birthday present, just show me a screen cap of your DVR is set to record hacking the system. And Grant Davis from Rage Select podcast, uh, and uh, by the way, my co-host Jason Murphy is on Rage Select podcast threw together this this amazing uh hacking the system returns 40 second uh, turn with a couple of screws and a couple of wires into a taser how did you make that thing i can't tell you but i will say and it really did take me less than five minutes once it's finished all you have to do is charge the thing up like this and it's ready to rock half discharge like oh god <laughs> 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 All right, so if you want to laugh like salacious what crumb. <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, here, uh, let me, let me go ahead and do, do my pick. <laughs> go for uh, it. Go for it. I, uh, you know, really, and this is, this is, I'll, I'll put very much in context of just finishing the Martian, uh, Andy Weir's, uh, novel on audiobook that, uh, I really am excited for hacking the system this <laughs> one day on Nat Geo. I've had the pleasure of seeing some of the early episodes while Brian was still filming them. I saw some of the rough cuts. Uh, it is it is a show not only that everybody who is listening to this will enjoy because you know Brian and you you likely watched the uh, the, the the first couple specials, but they are intensely shareable and they are very friendly to new viewers. This is something where you can just recommend it to some random person that knows that barely shares your sensibilities, but also uh, you are never more than uh, you know sixty seconds away from learning something and, and having a fun little fact that you can bring to the water cooler the next day. Uh, it, it is a perfect use of Brian and Jason as incredibly likable people with uh, you know an amazing 
uh, wrapper around it. It, it. It's something that I think everyone's going to be really, really pumped to watch. Tomorrow, 10 p.m. Eastern time. That's 9 Central. <laughs> oh, is it? I, I didn't know. Uh, by the way, I, I have I have a different uh, a clip that I thought you guys might like here. Let's just go ahead. <laughs> Uh, hey, Brian, what's your pick? <laughs> My pick is not hacking the system. My pick is for the hacking the system live watch party that we're hey! doing tomorrow night <laughs> on DiamondClub.tv. We're going to have a big old fat party. Jason Murphy, co-host of National Geographic's Hacking the System, will be joining us live. It's going to be amazing. Uh, although, although if I wanted to give you guys some content <laughs> outside of that, um, I, uh, you guys know that I'm a fan oh, of 99% no. Invisible. Uh, it's a... eh, Brian, eh. What does that have to do with hacking the system? Save it for next week. All save right. it for next week. I'll, I'll save fine. it. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure he'll be tuning in for the Hacking the System live watch party <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, dude, it's well, going to be amazing. Listen, I mean, let me just make this clear. Uh, this is uh you know a, a real big moment uh, i know uh you know not only for for brian but for everybody around uh, uh you know around brian that has seen what went into you know you you shooting that and and how much effort uh that that, that you put into it i know that you're really proud of, of of the product and this is going to be something that uh i i really think is going to be worth everybody getting behind because uh, it, you got a great time slot. You're, you're behind the channel's uh, current biggest show. You know they're really giving you a good, uh, a, a good shot here. And yeah, the, the, uh, sp that... specifically, like uh, I believe their number one show is uh, Brain Games. I might be wrong about that, but I do know that mar tomorrow, uh, Monday, probably is most uh, today, as most of you are listening to this, they are doing an all day extravaganza where they're doing nothing but Brain Games, leading into the premiere of Brain Games for the season, followed by. It's a hell of a leading for uh, for for hacking the system. Uh, and Brian, that is, that's fantastic. That it is awesome. all matters, guys. Like if you are tweeting about it, it matters. If you have a DVR, it matters. If you can watch it live, it matters. Uh, if you know, getting behind this show on its premiere date means everything. So if you want to support it today, if you're listening to this Monday is the time to do it. So Monday, 10 p.m. Eastern Time, 9 p.m. Central. And, and guess what? Hey, Brian, a week from tomorrow, Monday night? If only we could do it all over again. Oh, the way we can. So listen, if you're getting this message Tuesday and you're like, oh, man, I missed out. Oh, I failed, Brian. I failed these guys. I'm horrible. What do I do? Uh, watch it next week. Yeah, dude, uh, uh, they're, they're, they're going to be, uh, we got a lot of episodes. It turns out that when you leave your family for three or four months straight, you get to record a lot of awesome television during that time. That's going to get played and played and played and played. And uh, uh, I'll tell you what, man, you guys are going to dig. Uh, one of the things that we do with the watch party is there'll be brief moments where we play enough of the audio that you can synchronize up our experience with your live viewing whether it's time shifted whether it's live whatever it is uh we, we essentially want to make this kind of your unofficial um uh, companion your audio companion to, to to watching it your commentary track uh which by the way a certain a certain other uh network that's also delightful that i also work with uh seems to have done that this past friday uh do you see mythbusters essentially did their watch Mythbusters with Adam and Jamie thing. Like, like it was pretty much straight up our gag. Uh, no, but I think it's a great idea. And one that uh, we pioneered with the hacking the system specials and don't trust Andrew May. Agreed. Congratulations, Adam and Jamie. We hope you enjoy it. Anyway, thank you to everybody who uh, was so patient during the shooting of all that. I'm so excited, dude. I'm crazy stoked. I'm gonna be insanely uh, drunk for that. I'm just going <laughs> to celebrate so hard. Brian's going to hack his own reality. Yeah, dude, I'm going to oh. I'm going to I'm going to do mushrooms for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, I don't 
fans no tune in. This is this is the so big. TV. This is the go home, man. Really? We gotta plug this. I mean, yeah, come on, man. It's like what what else is it gonna be? It's like it's like it turns out I don't even know how to do it. I'm just eating like uh, shiitake mushrooms. I'm like, nom, nom, oh my god, this is the greatest moment of my life. <laughs> So Brian, are you having that moment where you're afraid you're gonna wake up tomorrow and realize it was all a dream? Uh, like, if it is, on dude, TV. I'm gonna wake up and I'll be like, best dream ever. You're like, like, hey, buddy, is it on? Like, and like, it's an empty room. <laughs> you're back by yourself. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> my life, my children, my co-hosts. I'm, it turns. Oh man. What, okay, let's let's talk. Wait, then you hear my voice going. Imagine that we do a show and you have your own TV show. <laughs> My life is a is an Andrew Main weird thing scenario. Pretty much my <laughs> definition of hell. Like the idea that everything is undone and I'm 18 years old is pretty much a nightmare. I don't even know. Like, okay, this is actually. Can, can we do a little cherry on top? If you suddenly woke up at 18, uh, ev uh the the past however many years were undone, happy or not happy? Oh, I'm annoyed. Oh, you're annoyed, so I'm broken. Like, I'm so invested. I'm so invested in, in what my life has become. I, I'm so emotionally invested in my kids and my wife and, and, and the life I've created. If I woke up and this was a dream, I mean, I'd probably I'd probably roll over and eat a bullet. Just, you know, like, oh, well, that was a dream. Never going to get better. Not me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, there was a book called by Ken Grimwood called like Replay, and it was like about that. Like a guy, guy wakes up in his life, like he, and this was this book about the eighties, where he's like he wakes up and it's like nineteen seventy or something like that. So like, he goes and makes Star Wars and all these other things too. It's like oh man, if I woke up I'm eighteen years old, I'm thinking like all right, who's been dating? Who should I have been dating? Uh, what do I know now that I that I was too stupid to know then? I'll tell you what, man, I uh, forgive the language, but it's like I sit here and describe it as a nightmare scenario that would induce me to immediately commit suicide. And the same proposal to Andrew made. I wish we had a screen grab of the Tom Cruise like grin on his face as he says, not me. <laughs> I don't have like, I don't have a wife or kids, so it's not like I would be murdering them, you know, with my wish. <laughs> Uh, which, by the way, uh, uh, you, you finished. Um, uh, this is kind of semi-spoilery or whatever, but 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 you finished uh, uh, the Abyss Beyond Dreams, right? No, I have not. I'm still like I'm maybe halfway into it. Oh my god, it's so good. And and you need. I I'm gonna I'm gonna be on you to go back and read um, uh, the whole uh, Void trilogy because one of the, my favorite things about that series, and I, and I, I don't think this is a story like like to have a hardcore science fiction story where it builds in a structure, like a scientific structure for how you could do things like travel through time uh, uh, and, and, uh, and, and ESP and telepathy and, and uh, telekinesis and stuff. Like uh, th their answer is, is that all of this takes place inside an abyss and, and the abyss as, as more important things have to happen. Like if you're gonna use uh, your mental ability to go back in time, well then it needs to rebuild reality back to however far back you go mentally and in order to do that the abyss has to expand and absorb a few more stars convert them into energy and then rebuild reality to to this thing uh it's 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 a brilliant brilliant uh combination of the hardest science fiction i've ever read and some of the, my favorite uh fantasy that i've ever read let's do a little bit every night i really enjoyed it so far so right on man right, guys, i'm really I excited think... that we survived this episode uh, yeah, I didn't expect everything to work. Let let us all well, praise Musk. We still have after things too, so I'm gonna say it's been weird. I will agree. So will I. Now it's not so weird. <laughs> all right, so here now I'm saving this. <laughs> uh, that was that was very kind of you guys to uh, to to ring the bell on uh, on hacking the system. I appreciate that. Yeah, Brian. Whatever you know. <laughs> Typical well, Brian. Uh, we are we are we are uncontainably proud and excited for you. So it is it is a. Do, do you want me to record after things, or are we gonna rely on Leon's auto system for that? Because I know we're we're still outputting right now. Whatever's the least amount of work for me. Uh <laughs> that's 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 oh, a good question. Well, I don't know. What, how are we putting these out? 
Uh, well, I what I usually do is, uh, especially now that we have um, uh, the fabulous Bryce Castillo putting them out for us, making up um, notes and titles and stuff. Uh, uh, hold on, weird things. Yeah, I think Bryce has been putting them out through Patreon. I think I've seen him in our, our you know, site. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. He yeah. is or is not? He is. Yeah, he is. That's how good he is. Yeah, that's how good he is. So, He's the best. Oh, dude, real dude, quick dude. before we do after things. Dude, dude, um, dude. Uh, what what do we call in this episode? Uh, can, can can we call it? Uh, what was it? Uh, uh, Wayland Tyrell Musk. Um, Wayland Tyrell Musk. Yeah, that's that's what we're gonna call it. Uh, I'm trying to think. How do we put? You know, I think like if you chill, I was like, oh, watch Hacking the System on Monday night in Giordano. You know? <laughs> Musknet. No, I like I like Musknet. Boom. Ha ha. All right, let me start uploading this as well. So we're heading towards, I, you know, my internet killed. If it dies out, whatever, I'll try to reconnect. But we we'll, we we'll, we just made, made it the weird thing, so that's good. Um, awesome. Ah, finally. It's hard to get one that'll shut his mouth. Holy crap, Eric Landingham died? Yeah, uh, I just read that randomly. I was going to ask you if that was true or, or what. What happened? Um, uh, Eric Lanigan. Um, Holy crap. Jesus. Yeah, Eric Lanigan, uh, who was a a uh, you know I, I guess probably most well known on uh, on 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 Twit, um, I guess is no longer with us. That's insane. Sorry to hear that. Eric was uh, part of the original um, Tech News Today team. Yeah. Yeah, no, very, very young. We got comments from Bill Meeks, from Jackie Hearn, Paul Dixon. <clears throat> uh, yeah, no, my, I know all of our condolences. It's a, it, it really is an, an, an absolute shame to lose somebody that, that young with that much talent. Holy crap nuts. Yeah. <clears throat> it is a... It's a left hook. I don't really know him all that well. I mean, like, uh, did you ever... Did, uh, were, were, were you someone who found yourself in... Uh, opposite for them? Um, <clears throat> no, I, was, I wasn't. For sure, uh, I, I think I only met him once or twice. Actually, no, I take that back. We, um, I, I appeared on his uh, um, one of his tech shows. Uh, we were talking about the nature of the studio. In fact, it was one of the places I would point people to for a walk through the studio and uh, and that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, man, I, it's. Do it, I, 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 you know why I hate myself? Um, because it's like I can't help but, but want to know how or why or whatever. I had I had the same thing. My my best friend from high school, uh, John Hill, uh, committed suicide, and I never found out how he did it. And I've always had this morbid curiosity as to yeah. As a matter of fact, um, it was when you and I first met each other. I had to find out that uh, John had committed suicide, and then go out and that night do. F four shows at at, at, at Halloween, at Horror, Halloween Nights. Horror Nights. Like, ah, ha, ha, Mr. Happy Pants, that's hilarious. My best yeah. friend from high school killed himself, you know? Um, but, you know, it's, it's, 
we're pattern seeking creatures, you know, and we want to know how the dots connect. That's that's a very, very human trait, you know, and, and especially when like you have the finality of I mean I would also say presented. It, it's just it's hard to deal with the fact that there are no more dots and you keep fixating on the ones that you have yet to connect. I mean, it's uh, the mere fact that they're not saying, uh, you know, it's like there are two things that tend to kill. I mean, men yeah, if, 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 if he got hit by a bus, it would be he got hit by a bus. Correct. Correct. But the mere fact that uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's car wrecks and uh, suicide. And so since they're not loudly saying car wreck, I got it. I mean, listen, uh, just know this to anybody, you know, uh, I think the one thing about this stuff is that you will always, uh, it always gives us, uh, you know, the silver linings, it gives us a chance to talk to, I mean, if you are in a position where that seems like an option to you, you need to talk to as many people as possible about it. You know, just did, don't, don't get yourself caught in a uh a spiral that you can't see your you can't see the top of you know there are there are so many people out there that care about you uh, i don't care who you are like this is always a true fact this is a constant and true fact and you, you know you gotta you, everybody you, everybody everybody you matter you absolutely matter and, and and sometimes we're our lowest our friends don't know it and that's the hardest part is that sometimes people reach out and we don't know they're they're reaching out and that can kind of sometimes make it worse because you're you're trying to and people aren't there, but you have to know it's because people don't know. You know, people don't understand what's going on inside. And everybody goes through this. Everybody goes through that period of questioning, you know, what's next, the worth, all these things. But it's it's normal to have these thoughts, but don't make understand that that's the future and that's everything. Yeah, and, and let me let me just make clear, uh, you know, I, I, we, we, we respect the wishes of uh, the, the, the family, you know, and, and if, if that's not public knowledge, you know, uh, or, or they, I mean, they don't we don't know speculating we, about it, then yeah. that's fine. Let, let, let's broaden it beyond the fact that we very much uh, miss, uh, you know, uh, Eric for, for however we had a relationship with him via this podcasting community, which I know means something to us because that's how we have relationships with a lot of people that are listening right now is the just people that you know coming through your tiny little speakers in your earbuds or or watching on youtube or on live stream uh and, and just say generally listen like it matters you matter uh and and these are all uh very very natural feelings that you know there are people that want to help you work through them i mean i guess uh if there's anything to be said you know regardless of of what the you know what the cause of death was um there it, it's it is shocking to me what a two-way street the relationship is over the strangest of mediums you know uh the three of us you know two of us sitting in converted bedrooms one of us driving with our chauffeur all of us bound together by you know those magical waves of the internet and 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 you know 158 people sitting in the room watching the three of us run our mouths off um you know, it's it's clear, and I hope that Eric's family feels that he affected people, that he uh, uh, was he he touched people that he would never meet. And uh, I know the reverse is true. I know there was one time when uh, uh, when I found out that somebody in you know chat realm had died. I mean, there was. I mean, think about think about you know someone like Crash Kincaid who had a battle with cancer. Uh, in one of our earliest episodes with Michael Rooker, you know, here's here's a guy who I still to this day haven't met, but uh, but yeah. I value and care so much about. I mean, it's um, the relationship may be virtual, but the connection is absolutely real, and uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, certainly uh, Eric re- touched a lot of people, and. Um, and that uh, that's a real connection. Oh, jeez, jeez, man. Uh, you know, there, there ain't there ain't no good way to segue from it. You know, and and there's there's only so much that uh, you know you want to just uh, you want to just say the same thing over and over again. I know, you know, uh, for 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 Eric, you know, he's he's, he's left a legacy. We care uh, a lot about it, and and he was a part of this community, and uh, we honor. Um, you know, everything that he did and 
you know, and, and that can both be true while we are simultaneously, uh, you know, uh, angry that he did not get to do more. Uh, uh, all this is, is true. Yeah, dude. Uh, stuff got a little bit real in the after things. Uh, <clears throat> um, uh, no, we're going, man. After things is uh, after things is a free flowing conversation. Right, I think we're in. Wait, 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 what do you got for after things? Well, what I want to talk about on after things is. I want to get a little bit of the backstory on the journey of one of the members of the team here who has a show premiering tomorrow night called Hacking the System. <laughs> Ryan, you are in a, you know, for, for people listening, people participating, you're a guy that from the outside would appear to be very successful. I, I've had those phone calls in, with you and, and know that you're just a complete utter wreck and uh, a shell of a man, really. Yeah. Just... Just, Accurate. just a meat puppet maintained by insecurities, fear, and self-loathing that somehow found yourself in this position. And not the confident, secure guy who managed to do what he did. And I'm maybe speaking of myself, too, about many things I've done. So, but let's talk about this. So your show premieres tomorrow, Hacking the System. You went through the whole process. We can get into that. But that's, that is when people, when people write down life goals, things they want to do, what is the high point? That's kind of, that's it, Brian. After that, everything else is a sequel. Everything else is, and then you did this. This is the thing. This is the summation of everything you've worked towards got you to this point, which is an amazing, incredible point. Um, the percentage of human beings that have lived on the planet that ever got their own TV show is very, very insignificant, that ever got to see their certain position like this. And doing something, by the way, educational and informational, that's actually, it's not... You're not just a guy, you know, playing, reading lines on a sitcom or stealing pies from people in a parking lot or something. <laughs> you're a guy that can build information, though. So you're a guy that took a passion of yours, your love of science and technology, and hacking the system is very much, it's, 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 it's part of your soul. It's part of what you are. And it had, to be, it had its fingerprints from a lot of people. Other people got to handle the Brian Brush with clay. Maybe times, sometimes literally, that's how you got your show, let's be honest. But now this is coming on air. How do you feel right now, this moment? Uh, I'll tell you what, dude. I am happier today. And uh, uh, this is dark on, on the heels of, of the last topic of conversation. Uh, I myself uh, had been uh, dealing with a lot of, like, terror and depression because I didn't know. You know, it's like uh, there's no shortage of television programs that get made and almost come out and then something goes sideways and then they get scuttled last minute or they, uh, you know, uh, the, the environment surrounding them changes and they don't work out or whatever. But it's like I am I am finally I have lived for 10 months with clenched fists and today is finally the day that I finally. Feel those. I, I mean, I wish you could have seen the shit-eating grin on my face today as I was riding my bicycle and I, I, I was finally able to just unclench because at this point, it's going to do what it's going to do. And um, uh, you nailed it. The fact that this isn't me showing up to read lines uh, is, is both a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing in that uh, I get to inject a real part of my personality into the show. And I get to put, I get to talk about things that I'm knowledgeable about and that I care about. Um, the, the downside is that the entire process of making that art, I cared very deeply about it. And as a result, it was very difficult to make compromises. However, you know, it's not necessarily my money being spent. There are, uh, there are, uh, uh, expert team members that I have to defer to uh, for various things, and that is an agonizing process. I'm sure you went through the same thing with Don't Trust Andrew Maine, right? For sure, for sure. It, it's a, it, TV is a very collaborative process. No matter how much your mug appears on, you know, your your it is is very very much that. Um, I'm gonna. I've been reading the the Pixar Touch by Ed Catmull, who's president of Pixar. And he's a very interesting guy. He wanted to be an animator when he was a kid, realized he really couldn't animate, 
but then decided that he liked computer science. He was one of the first early pioneers of computer animation, went on to start the computer animation division at ILM, but then became Pixar. He talks about the start of the book about when Toy Story premiered. He's president of Pixar. I think he's probably maybe 50 at this point. He's president of Pixar for his whole life's mission was to be able to create realistic 3D animated characters that you didn't think about them being computer animated, that you thought about them as characters and being real. Pixar comes out, uh, Pixar releases Toy Story. Toy Story is a huge success. The reviews are great. They talk about how great of a movie it is. And then they mention casually, oh, yeah, it's computer animated. He achieved what he set out to do. He achieved what he wanted to do. But now he's in this position where he says to himself, now what? Well, and and uh, I'm not gonna lie, you know, I I, I turned 40 yesterday, and uh, that's been weighing heavily on me, and uh, uh, I I I think that's part of the reason. Like I spent I spent the last month waiting for a lot of things to happen. I waited for a lot of milestones to occur. I waited until I hit 40. I waited until um, uh, the TV show successfully launched, which you know, barring some unforeseen disaster, appears to happen in the next 24 hours. Uh, hey, nobody murder a head of state. No earthquakes. Yeah, no dude. Attacks. Banned. Oh, please, guys. Be cool, please. people. Let Brian have yeah. His day. Yeah, just wait until after that, you know, and then, uh, and, and. Just sweet Brian. <laughs> and then, uh. Brian, don't release your, your, your a la cartoons tomorrow either. All right, good. I'll wait. Uh, and, uh. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, and, and, and also. please, can the star of Brain Games keep his opinion about gays and his, uh, Christian faith to himself? To himself. You know, just, just, let's just, let's just play it cool. You hear that, Jason Silva? Um, the. <laughs> Uh, uh, as we get there, I mean, I am, I am the happiest I've been in months in that, uh, I just, I, I'm so thrilled that, uh, uh, I don't know, seems like, uh, seems like it's going to happen and, and, you know, whether or not it does super well or, or like at this point I get to switch over into having fun mode. And that is the one mode I haven't been able to have for a long time. So I mean, do, so you, we we've we've talked a lot uh, about you know just just your your anxiety leading into this Jesus. this triple header of of, of milestones and everything like it's putting is, it mildly it, yes. Do you feel like things are kind of I think unclenching is a good uh, a good phrase for it that yeah. the, the that that this is the pressure of the moment and not like some permanent fugue state that is upon you. No, well, and, and that's the thing, is the whole year, it's like, I, I, I haven't been able to see the end. I haven't known how long this is going to be. I mean, you could do, you could do anything when you, when you see the end of it, right? Um, yeah. But, but uh, you know, moving away from the family. Because that can be the beginning of other stuff. Correct, you know, correct. Like, like now you have the, the time and the mind share to do it, and that's the, the, the problem with, uh, well, not the problem, but just part of the deal when you work in situations like, you know, with television, there's a lot of hurry up and wait. You know, there's a lot of you're really excited and now keep that excitement for six months while we wait and prepare and edit and have it come out at the right time. So you're behind. And there's there's a little of that, you know, sort of as a residual thing, because it's like, I don't know if they're going to pick it up for another season or whatever. And obviously that affects my ability to commit to, you know, like uh, 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 if I was told today, yeah, these episodes are going to come out and that'll be it and that'll be the end of it. Then, then I would start tomorrow going to work on you know launching a new web series or planning a a, a, a night attack tour at, at colleges or you know whatever. So it's like there's a little bit of ambiguity of just not knowing you know where it's going to go. Uh, but man, compared to what I've lived with for the last year, that volume has turned way the hell down. And plus, you also. Like you kind of know when you when you've got something good, you know. It's like it's a good show. It's a good show, and it does exactly what what I hoped it would. And uh, and I feel like there's uh, I feel like now the game is uh, all of us to make as much noise as possible on the internet, and that is to me a reward in and of itself. Like like well, like. Brian, you'll be happy. Check the front page of TMZ tomorrow. My headline: Brian Brushwood drugged and raped me. <laughs> and what happens just as long as it says what happens next will shock you <laughs> yes the hacking the system host has found himself on the wrong side of the law yeah uh yeah dude it's uh i'm real. i'm way excited about it and it's like and more importantly i'm excited about what we're going to do next you know it's it's not just that um 
uh, that yay the thing is coming out but it's like yay we get to the part where literally the way to serve the show best is for us to be as funny as loud as outrageous as you know uh, as as much of a marching band as all of us can participate in and that's awesome so I may cut out it if I do you guys can totally carry on without me of course um, I think I want to yeah, I think I think we might be at the edge of the edge of Andrew here. I don't know. I say that's his new album cover. <laughs> <laughs> From the edge of space, Andrew Main. <laughs> As well. Oh, God, it's all gonna. Uh, yeah, I think I, th- I think we're losing you there, bud. If you can hear us, yeah, we have an internet connection problem. We're hanging up on you. Godspeed, Major Tom. Well, and mm. there he goes, ladies and gentlemen. Fucking prima donna. Oh, Jesus, this guy. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Arr, Arr, what? I'm going to play the arrowhead. Yeah, yeah. I can't sound perfect. Arr. Fuck you. I'm not, I'm I'm not just, hosting uh, the show anymore. I rely on the limitations of the LTE. I'm fan Andrew Maine. Hi, Andrew. Hi. Oh, look yeah. at me. I'm full of ideas yeah. and insight and yeah. smarts. Yeah. I insist we do an after things and then bail halfway through. <laughs> That's the old Andrew <laughs> trick. Uh, oh, look at that. Uh, live on the line, we have Andrew Main from space. Yeah, at any moment, uh, I will lose my signal again. And, and, and there will, we go. Will, uh, <laughs> again, but, uh, uh, all right. Well, hey, let's. I guess let's. I would love to. I, I'm excited to talk to you next Sunday. Yes. We are excited to talk to you, Andrew. <laughs> when you return to planet Earth, we look forward to encountering your stories of the alien women you sexed. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Andrew May. <laughs> <laughs> so long, yeah. Debit Daddy. We hardly knew yeah. you. Yeah. All right. Bye. Bye, 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 bye. I guess we'll shut down. That's uh, that's that's after things. For yeah. this episode, it's been after. What was our? What was it's our it's tag? it's been after weird it's been things. It, it was a. This is ninety nine percent. Oh crap! Hold on. What what, what time is um? What time is jury? Nine o'clock. Seven seven nine o'clock my time. Seven your time, right? Jay. Yeah. All right. Take care, guys. It happens every summer. Small turtles called diamondback terrapins skitter out of the water around JFK Airport in New York. They start moving west. They're heading for a patch of sand where they like to lay their eggs, and they have to cross over one of the airport's runways to get there, runway 4L. Sometimes there's so many turtles on the move at once that the control tower has to delay flights. Now the press loves doing stories about how funny this is, how a fleet of giant airplanes can be held up by just a few tiny turtles. But hold that picture in your mind and think about the Caribbean Sea in 1492. There were almost a billion sea turtles living in it back then. Columbus's men, anchored in the Caribbean, wrote about being kept awake at night by the thwacking of so many turtle shells against the sides of their ship. Notice how that scene is the exact opposite of the scene at JFK. It's not a fleet of giant airplanes being held up by a few tiny turtles. It's a giant fleet of turtles bombarding just a few relatively tiny ships. So I wrote this book about people and wild animals in America and it only really started because I wanted to show my daughter endangered species in the wild before they disappeared. Like a lot of people, I think, I felt this pang. I knew that all around us, beautiful parts of the world are expiring. And I also knew that people in the future, they might not even notice. For them, a world without whales or wilderness might feel normal. I wanted to counteract that forgetting that's bound to take hold over time. This forgetting has a name. Scientists call it shifting baseline syndrome. It means that all of us accept the version of the world we inherit as normal. Over the years, we watch forests get logged or animals disappear, but 
when the next generation comes along, they accept that depleted version of nature as their normal. It's hard to zoom out, really feel the changes that are stacking up across the generations. I can't even imagine what an ocean filled with a billion sea turtles must feel like. Last winter, I was in Hawaii, and I saw three sea turtles, and I flipped the f out. <laughs> I felt like I was in Eden. It wasn't so long ago, though, that America was a kind of Eden, when people could be dwarfed and engulfed by wild animals in a way that feels almost impossible now. In the late 1800s, trains would sometimes have to stop for four or five hours as streams of buffalo moved across the tracks. Occasionally, a stampede would batter into the side of a train, derailing it. A witness described one of these scenes, 1871, in Kansas. Each individual of Buffalo went at it with the desperation and despair of plunging against green locomotive cars, just as blind madness chanced and directed. After having trains thrown off the track twice in one week, conductors learned to have a very decided respect for the idiosyncrasies of the Buffalo. This man's name was William Temple Hornaday. He was a bombastic Midwesterner with an elaborate mustache. Hornaday was head taxidermist at the Smithsonian and he traveled the globe hunting exotic animals and stuffing them for the museum. In India, after he took down an elephant, he climbed atop the carcass and popped open a bass ale. Once, he trapped an orangutan, named it Little Man, and gave it to Andrew Carnegie as a pet. It sounds weird, but for Hornaday, killing these animals was a kind of conservation. He believed by stuffing them, he was preserving endangered species and for the future generations that might not know them after they were gone. Through taxidermy, he could make them immortal. In 1886, Hornaday looked west and saw that Americans were killing so many buffalo so rapidly that the prairie was almost empty. He figured there were maybe less than 300 buffalo left in the wild, and so he did what he thought was the most helpful and logical thing. He lit out for Montana to kill several dozen of them. Hornaday shot 25 buffalo in Montana and he built the best looking ones into an exhibit at the museum. He gathered them around a fake watering hole looking forlorn. But from there his thinking evolved. He realized he was basically just a funeral director embalming the species that America was exterminating. It occurred to him, what if we actually tried to keep these animals alive? And so he became one of America's first real wildlife conservationists, an activist, a lobbyist, a celebrity. America was killing every conceivable kind of animal in their way, and Hornaday stood up for all of them, from icons like the grizzly to lowlier, less majestic things like the squirrel. A live squirrel in a tree is poetry in motion. We ask every American to lend a hand to save the silver tail. There was really only one animal on the continent that Hornaday wasn't worried about. It would seem too mighty to be brought down by men with guns, and it lived in a cold and brutal wilderness that men couldn't possibly take over. The polar bear is the king of the frozen north. It's not very probable that the polar bear 
will ever be exterminated by man. That's Hornaday, writing in 1914. Back then, no one could have imagined a problem as abstract as climate change. But think about how quickly climate change has changed the polar bear's reputation in our minds. It's gone from bloodthirsty man-killer to delicate, drowning victim. 200 years ago, Arctic explorers wrote about polar bears leaping into their boats and trying to eat them, even if they lit the bear on fire. But recently, when I went to the tiny northern town that calls itself the polar bear capital of the world, Martha Stewart had just arrived to film the animals for her daytime show on the Hallmark Channel. The town is called Churchill, Manitoba. It's on the edge of Hudson Bay, and every fall, right before the bay freezes over, Churchill gets overrun with about 900 polar bears and 10,000 polar bear tourists. Bears routinely wander into town. They like hanging out at the elementary school, especially. Folks can call 675-BEAR, and a squad of bear patrol officers will come chase the animals back onto the tundra in their trucks. Bears that won't budge are tranquilized and shipped out to a Quonset hut near the airport. Once this so-called polar bear jail fills up, each animal is drugged again and airlifted one at a time to an area north of town. Crowds of tourists come out to watch these bear lifts, and I went to one myself. something just a little ceremonial about the bear lift I went to. How the uniformed wildlife officers arranged the sleeping bear on a net at the center of the crowd. How they tucked its paws carefully across its chest like some drunken uncle after Thanksgiving dinner. It was so careful, beautiful, and confusing. A couple of people cried. It was like the opposite of an animal sacrifice, a ritual to save the bear, to show how far out of our way we'd go not to kill it. I stood there and watched, and as I did, Martha Stewart stood next to me. Her crew was there, filming everything. Honestly, it's a breathtaking thing to watch, a polar bear flying away. All of a sudden, the helicopters started to churn, the edges of the net lifted. The furry shape inside contracted into a U, and then the entire package was off the ground. The helicopter climbed toward a cloud bank, the bear twirling slightly underneath it like a tea bag. And then, finally, the polar bear was gone. I know, airlifting polar bears. It's strange, no one could have imagined it would come to this. But the way we help animals now has evolved into a surreal kind of performance art. We carry migrating salamanders across busy highways. We monitor pygmy rabbits with drones. At Cornell, scientists breeding endangered peregrine falcons were a specially made receptacle they called the copulation hat, coaxed a bird named beer can to ejaculate on their heads several times a day, every day, for much of the 1970s. See, this is another baseline that shifts over time, the lengths we're willing to go. Each generation does what would have looked like fighting for a preposterous lost cause to the one before it, and then each generation comes along anew and does a little bit more than that. And on it goes, humanity strapping on the proverbial population hat again and again and again. 
consider the story of George and Tex. In the late 1970s, there were only a handful of whooping cranes left in the wild, and also a small number at a government lab in Maryland. Scientists there were doing their best to wring as many new offspring as they could from those captive birds. But the lab had one problem child, a female crane named Tex. As a newborn, Tex had been raised in a cardboard box in the zookeeper's living room. And having never seen another crane, she imprinted on the one animal she did see, the zookeeper. Basically, she wound up sexually attracted to people and not other cranes. The scientists kept trying to pair Tex off, but Tex wasn't interested. She wanted a man, and specifically a man who looked like her old zookeeper, a dark-haired white man of medium build. Now, there was a young crane conservationist named George Archibald, and George happened to be a dark-haired white man of medium build. He took Tex to rural Wisconsin, put a mattress in her pen, and moved in as Tex's companion. They'd forage together, build a nest, and they'd dance, George doing deep knee bends and springing up with his arms out like wings. He'd whoop and holler, come on, Tex, come on. Come on, Tex. And soon, they'd be dancing together just like wild cranes do during courtship. This would get Tex aroused, and at just the right moment, two assistants would rush out from a hiding place and artificially inseminate her with crane semen. George did all this for three years, living with Tex for months at a time because the eggs she kept laying were infertile. The man and crane would start out after dawn, they'd go for a walk, and they'd dance. They'd dance, and they'd dance, and they'd dance. George didn't enjoy any of this. He was miserable, actually. Miserable. But in the spring of 1983, Tex finally laid an egg that hatched, and George was right there when it did. He was invited on The Tonight Show to celebrate. One headline read, Man, Crane, Proud Parents of Chick. George named the chick Chee Wiz. By now, Gee Wiz has 44 grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Today, there are more whooping cranes in the wild than there have been in almost a hundred years. William Temple Hornaday, the taxidermist, died in 1937. At his funeral, buglers from the local Boy Scout troop surrounded the coffin and played home on the range. Twenty years later, workers at the Smithsonian were dismantling Hornaday's buffalo exhibit, the one he built after the hunt in Montana, the one he thought would last forever. They found a rusty box buried in the fake ground. Inside was a letter. It was from Hornaday, written to his future successor at the museum. Dear sir, when I am dust and ashes, I beg you to protect these specimens from the deterioration and destruction. At last, the game butchers of the Great West have stopped killing the buffalo. All the buffalo are dead. D. 
Hornaday had written that pessimistic letter in 1887 when he was still just a young taxidermist. Turns out he was wrong. The buffalo were not all dead. And in the years to come, he actually played a big role in helping to save them. Lots of other species too. But it was hard for him to focus on those successes. He'd lost so many more battles than he won. By the end of his life, he turned bitter disillusioned. I tried to inject the courage into the hearts of men, but today I think that speaking generally, civilized man is an unmitigated ass. Like all of us, his imagination was hopelessly trapped in its own moment, its own lifetime. He could only see the world through the tiny keyhole of the present. Thank you. 
So where does that leave us then, in our present? Maybe all any one of us can do is push against the baseline as it shifts. We can be a tiny counterweight. We weigh almost nothing, but generation after generation that weight adds up. Sometimes, in some places, the baseline starts to shift in the other direction, in the direction of more beauty, not less. But that happens incrementally too, and it can be hard to notice. So picture that scene at JFK again, all those turtles. When Hornaday was born, they were close to extinction, being hunted because they tasted so good in soup. We're like those turtles, a race of stubborn little things that barely notices as the wilderness it migrates through, fills up with villages and lights, and swells into an airport runway. Just keep migrating across it anyway, tucking the eggs of the next generation into the sand. But we're like the airplanes, too, because we have changed. We've changed into something that Hornaday couldn't ever have imagined, a species that can at least try to slow down, try to stop. I like to think about those airplanes powering down, the lines of them parting like a shiny metallic sea, so this tiny tribe of turtles can pass through. I get it, it looks funny in the present, but squint into the hazy panorama of history and those airplanes idling in place, that little moment of not moving forward looks unmistakably to me like progress. Take a break and be right back.